Welcome again. Um, this is a talk on the auto plane spotter. It's something which I've had in, as you'll see, going for a while. I had kind of hoped to have it working. Apologies, it isn't going to be because there wasn't enough time to get it set up. I will have it running at some point over the weekend. I'm not quite sure when, but you'll see later. Anyway, as an introduction, fundamentally, I see aircraft. I live in the West Country. I see aircraft on the flight paths around Bristol. This is a lot of the stuff around airports from my house, from my garden at work. And most of them are fairly boring. Sometimes they're interesting, but generally, I'm an aerospace engineer, which means if I see an aeroplane, I hear an aeroplane, I generally like to point at it. And I can't do that all the time. I cannot be awake 24 hours a day pointing at aeroplanes. And so as an engineer also, I would like to make a robot to do the things I can't. So <laughs> it all started right back in 2018, where I had this idea of, what if I had a thing to point at aeroplanes? Because I knew it was possible. About four years of kind of miscellaneous, not particularly directed messing around, which you're going to hear a little of now, I went to, now I have a thing to point at aeroplanes, which you can see beside me. It all works with ADSB. ADSB is Automatic Dependent Surveillance. Um, it's a signal pretty much every aircraft is going to send out. It's on 1090 megahertz, and they're going to be telling you who they are, where they are, how fast they're going, their altitude. There's quite a lot of information sometimes as well. They'll sometimes tell you what their autopilots are doing. There's quite a lot of information there. And if you have a relatively cheap USB stick, you can receive it. So I bought an RTL SDR um, software defined radio receiver to have a go at that. And I messed around with it a little bit. And I ended up with this. So this is a little bit of a preview of what you're going to see, just to give you an idea of what's involved in it. So the, RT the RTL SDR is connected into an antenna. That's this bit you can see here. Um, it's not the right antenna, but I kind of don't care because I want things to be near. Um, those are all connected into a USB hub, which is down here. That's connected to a Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi talks to an Arduino, which manages the stepper motors, which manage that pointer that you can see there. And those are the things that all together come to do it. And there's a few other things that I haven't shown here because at the moment they're not actually connected anyway. Um, effectively, everything is all pulled together. And it's actually quite modular, which is, as I discovered, quite useful. What it's doing is receiving where the aircraft is. It gets its latitude and longitude, and it knows its own latitude and longitude, so it can work out a bearing to the aircraft and a distance. It also, in 3D, can also work out the elevation to the aircraft from its altitude. And those two things together means that you can point directly at the aircraft or relatively close to directly at the aircraft. Once I had those ideas in mind, I started having a look into how I was going to do it and what prototypes and testing I was going to do. I started out something very simple. It was 2D only, so all it was doing was pointing in the direction of the aircraft. Um, I repurposed an old Shonkbot wheel, which is a project that some people I know wanted to get rid of the simplest possible robot that you could take into schools or something. And it basically showed that it worked. It was appropriately for its source of the wheel, very shonky, but it did work. And literally the pointer is just an arrow drawn on that blue wheel. So I started to move on to something better. Here I have two axes I can point around the bearing and on the elevation. It's much better, but the cable man management was absolutely terrible. Even after 10 minutes, I knew I didn't want to have to deal with that. And so I started thinking of what I could do. I could have slip rings. I wasn't sure that was going to work. I had a feeling that stepper motors might not like being connected to things via slip rings. Maybe they get disconnected. I could have a clock spring. Car steering wheels have a loosely wound spring for all the wires, which means you can turn it a few times before they start to bind. Or I could do something really clever with some kind of inductive magic. And so I was faced with the inevitable private project thing. Do I go for something boring, or do I do something that's going to rabbit hole me for months? In the end, I actually didn't choose to do the complicated thing. What I realized was that I can do this exactly like a clock, not like a clock spring, but like the hands of a clock. So it's got in here, it has two shafts. When they both move together, you get a bearing move. When the inner one moves relative to the outer, you get an elevation move. And it's literally just a little couple of bevel gears up there. And so that allows me to have continuous rotation because the motors don't move, which does make life a lot easier. Um, and that was then the point where I thought, well, I can really actually start testing things. So I moved on to the pointer on a stick. 
which is literally just the pointer with some things zip tied onto a stick in order to try and see if it worked. It actually took me a really long time to test this because I started getting to this point in 2020 and there weren't a lot of aeroplanes in 2020. And so I would get it, I would find some problems, I'd fix it, and then there'd be no aeroplanes for the rest of the day. And so I had a lot of photos like that where you can see it kind of, sort of, not really pointing at an aeroplane. But it did mean that it was quite modular, so I could test the pointer separately to the code to detect the aircraft. I also knew I was going to need to hold it up, and it was intended for installation, and it was intended for installation here. And so I thought, it needs to be held up. Could I have something that both holds it up, but also makes a bit of a fence around it? Because yeah, it's not super powerful. These aren't going to really hurt you. The printed parts would probably break before it hurt anyone. But it does move unexpectedly. And I thought, let's keep fingers away. And so maybe the way of holding it up could be a bit like a fence. And you can see some high quality string engineering there, but I ended up with a slightly nicer idea, which is this one, based on Skylon from the Festival of Britain in the 50s. And it's a 10 segrity structure, which is all very, very cool. Everything's in actual axial compression or sh uh, tension, no shear, no bending, anything. And so I thought this might be quite a nice idea, and I could try to see if I could get that working. So I had an idea to prototype it. And it wasn't quite Skylon, it's got a few extra load paths. The problem with a tensegrity structure is that it tends not to work at all unless everything is there. And installing something where it falls apart the instant you look at it, unless you've got everything in place, is really hard. So it's got some extra wires around the bottom. Um, the test fittings you might not be able to see on screen, but they're really terrible because my um, old mini Kossel printer was in the process of eating half of its belts. At this point, I've actually got everything together. Getting the tension right was really, really, really annoying. This is actually made out of tent parts. It's made out of a third-hand Van Gogh tent that we actually took to EMF camp and that died at an EMF camp, and we retired it after that. And for this project, I subsequently retired it in a kind of Blade Runner way, in that its parts were repurposed into a thing I was going to bring back to EMF camp. But the programming of the location was really quite irritating because you ended up having to get the exact latitude and longitude of where you were. You had to go and do it. I'm not very good at programming, so I had to actually go in and change the code. And so I thought, let's take a little detour. Maybe I can get GPS working. This is a side quest which actually wasn't too bad compared to the other one I could have been on. I had my old GPS unit. This is from 2005-ish. Um, and... You know, you need the base position to work out where you are. Getting from GPS sounds like a good idea. I know I used to use it for navigation in my PDA. Excuse me while I just crumble into dust. Um, that used Bluetooth. I didn't want to mess with that, so I thought surely it will be easier to get it working over USB. I tried for weeks to get this thing to talk to anything over USB. You can see I had all kinds of breakout boards and everything there. It was an absolute nightmare. And I tested and tested and tested, and then someone on Twitter said, no, it's just serial. <laughs> it turns out USB, yeah, it's got a USB plug. It's not USB, it's just serial. I could plug it directly into the Arduino. There's a library even there to manage the messages that come from it. But I ended up not using it because it actually takes quite a long time to get the, um, to get the um, fix from the position. And also, it, it doesn't work inside. And I knew I would have to use it inside. So that was a side quest, which is still there. And it's got the plugs to do it, but I don't tend to use it. So I move on to more testing. <laughs> Another thing which I found that were a problem is that I had these stepper drivers, and they're really, really nice. They're called the easy drivers. They require basically nothing else apart from power and signal, you know, step commands to work. Really, really nice. But you do have to be able to read. Um, <laughs> I wasn't phased by the fact that the current adjustment went the wrong way on my version because it's very old, and they fixed it in later versions. I had it connected for the step, I had the direction connected, I had 5 volt plugged into the 5 volt pin, and it wouldn't work. Every time I tried to turn the current up to something reasonable, it would just shut down, and I thought that was thermal. However, it turned out that I'm just really, really bad at plugging in electronics. Because what was happened was, I had 5 volts, and I wanted to run everything off 5 volts, because I had loads of 5 volts for the Raspberry Pi, and I didn't want two power supplies. I thought, I'll run it off 5 volts, I'll be pushing it, but it'll be fine. 
Yeah, that's not where 5 volt goes in. That's where 5 volt comes out. <laughs> These are easy drivers because they'll provide power for you to run your Arduino off. They're really nice. And it turns out they also don't mind if you give them 5 volts into the pin that they're trying to put 5 volts out of. How I didn't destroy them, I have no idea. But they did work. Anyway, I realized I was going to have to give it some power, and it was going to have to go up to the power where the pins where the power is supposed to go. So I gave it 19 volts from an old laptop power supply, and everything was much, much happier. That's actually going. It's not in its full thing, but it is basically in its final form. It's all working properly. Everything's moving really quick. It's not losing, losing steps. And actually pointing at the police helicopter going around our house, it was going round and round. It was quite happy. What I didn't realize was that it was actually getting wound up in software. And when, it, when they flew away, having presumably not found me, um, when they flew away and it lost it, went to the next aircraft, it went zipping around like crazy because it had been quite happily following it up and increasing and increasing, going up to like 2,000 degrees. And then when it went to the next one that was at five, it went all the way back. So I fixed that. <laughs> I, I went on to lots and lots of blurry photos like this. Is it working? Yeah, I don't know, maybe. Testing it, unless I'm outside, is really annoying because our house is kind of north-south, which meant I only had like plus minus 15 degrees west and a bit east. Um, it was kind of working, but it was quite annoying. But eventually I got con pretty much convinced of the fact it was working. I took it outside enough, I could see that it was going. So I was ready to finalize the installation. The envelope, which you can't see here because it actually hides everything and also because I ran out of time to put it on. Um, this was again designed to make it look a little bit like Skylon, so it's got that nice shape around it. I was testing it, the garden looking extremely nice actually. Um, in the garden you can see the base there, the base holds itself up before you put the central bit on, which Skylon wouldn't, which is what I did in order to make it a bit easier to install, it was stable there. Still really fiddly, still minimum of two people to get it set up. Um, every time you adjusted one, everything else would move because of all the redundant load paths. It was annoying, but it did basically seem to work. And it was installed, and it worked for about three hours. <laughs> because I had problems getting the right amount of power, it just needs a normal um, UK plug. And the only power that I had where it was to be installed was a C form. Um, and then it rained a lot once I'd actually got all that sorted. It didn't have a problem with spiders. I did discover a few when I got home. Um, but, you know, it was there, I'd proved the point, and I still had it. I had the thing to point at aeroplanes, so I had a few things I did post-EMF. I made a simpler stand, this is the one you can see here. It was a lot easier to set up, even though I nearly blew the change over time doing it. It's not as interesting, but it's a heck of a lot easier to do. <clears throat> and I was actually asked to do an installation at work. It was going to go into, this is 2023, it was going to go into the STEM Academy at work. So there were going to be a bunch of schools parties coming past to see it. They were, as it ends, quite interested in it. And I was commissioning it and making sure it was all pointed the right way. And an aircraft flew directly overhead, which is perfect for checking that it's calibrated properly. And so this presents normally the ICAO hex ID of the aircraft. It's a unique ID of all the aircraft in the world. I look it up on FlightAware. What is it? It's a C-32A. And I was a bit troubled because I had no idea what a V32A is and I'm an aircraft spotter and that, that, that burnt a little bit, I don't mind saying. Google it, what's, what's a C32A? It's a US Air Force 757. Oh, okay, what, what do they have those for? It's a VIP transport. It could be Congress, Vice President. Kind of interesting, that flew overhead. Next day. <laughs> <laughs> It's a little bit alarming. I was very, very pleased that this is an entirely passive system. <laughs> People with little spirally earpieces coming up to talk to me. And I told you, sometimes the aircraft are interesting. <laughs> that was possibly the most interesting one that's actually pointed at. But as expected, there's a bunch of things that I didn't finish, and I thought I'd talk about a couple of them. 
Number one, the software. The software is really bad. I'm very, very bad at Python. This is Python, and I'm not very good at it. One of the things that I wanted to do was something, something a little bit more interesting than just a list of figures popping down the screen with the hex ID, which is just some letters and numbers, and the bearing, the elevation, the altitude. So I thought, can I actually find a way to link aircraft, their ID, to what they are? And I found one. And I downloaded it, and I thought, I can do all of that pre-processing. I can turn it into something I can probably access in the Python. So um, it turns out there's a lot of aircraft in the world. Um, I didn't notice at the time, but it was a CSV file, and it was 10 minutes. It was, te it was about 60 megabytes, um, which is quite a lot of text. So I decided I was going to have to be pretty brutal and get rid of stuff. So if it didn't have any useful data, bin it. If it was a Cessna or a Piper with an N registration, that means it's from North America, and there's a lot of those also going to be getting the bin. So I've managed to turn a 60 meg CSV file into a 58 megabyte JSON file, and I still don't know if it works. <laughs> the other bit that I've got was maybe to have the display a little bit nicer. I'm learning from what I believe you could possibly agree is the master of making Python do nice things on screen, Matthias Wandel, who has just displays using a text interface on a Raspberry Pi. I thought I could probably do that. Maybe I could do something nicer. I didn't do any of that, or I did find his code. I also had some LEDs. Up here, there's a bunch of LEDs, and I thought it would be nice to have the colors change. I actually did test that. It does work. I didn't have the code here. Because actually, as you can see at the bottom, EMF is not a really good place to fly over at night. That's a, that's a NOTAM, so that's Notice to Air Missions. And that basically says searchlight and laser display with a one nautical mile radius, basically instant death if you fly over it beyond 7 o'clock in the evening. So I thought, well, it's not going to be close enough to be meaningful, so there's no point doing LEDs. Um, and here. As you can see, I have got it. It will eventually be plugged in. It does take a little bit while to get it going. One of the things that always makes me really nervous about it is I didn't realize, but when I bought the 5 volt power supply, it's a really big, chunky, meaty, meanwhile power supply. The 5 volt power supply has exactly the same plug as the 19 volt power supply that I've got. <laughs> so understandably, I don't like to be rushed when I plug it in. So I will have it set up somewhere. If you don't see it, it's not super weather tolerant. It is fairly spider tolerant. It's not, um, I say, it's also quite fragile. This is silk PLA, which looks lovely, but it breaks if you look at it funny. So um, if you do want to see it running, I will plug it in somewhere probably tomorrow. I will probably toot when I do because I'm on the Mastodon and I will be able to say what it is. And if you want to see it, you'll be welcome. It will then be basically quite happily pointing at the airplanes in a way that I can't because I can leave it running 24-7. And that's it. Thank you. Hope you find it interesting.